Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for today's webinar. We're gonna get started in just about one minute. We'll be talking to you real soon. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar about integrating CloudBees CoShip with Apranix for continuous app resilience. Just a few things that we know up top. We are recording, so if you need to leave earlier, perhaps you have a colleague who's unable to join, they will be able to view this later. Uh, two, you can ask questions. We will have time at the end for questions. So as soon as you think of one, please put it right into the question panel. Even if you think maybe we'll answer it partway through, it always helps to know what it is that you're looking to know more about. Um, this is part of our CloudBees CodeShip Innovator Program. So what that is, is we like to do these presentations with companies that we really see, feel value and, and really believe in their product and their culture as a company. And so I'm very excited to be doing another one of these. It's always great to hear from, from these CloudBees innovators. Uh, before, we, I take up too much more of your time. I do want to get more right into the presentation. So I'd like to pr introduce our presenter for today, uh, CEO and founder of Apronex, Govind. Govind, take it away. Thank you, Max. Really appreciate the time. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. I know everyone would be busy doing um, something or the other, and uh, we'll make it worthwhile to dial into this webinar. So we are going to introduce a great subject, if you will, you know, everyone knows continuous integration. You know, you have been using CodeShip, you have been using CloudBees and other products in the market. And slowly continuous delivery is getting accepted as one of the mechanisms for delivering applications uh, faster in smaller pieces across various infrastructures. Um, you know, be it VMs, uh, the traditional mechanism or uh, using containers, now using serverless and um, and maybe newer mechanisms are a combination of all of these together. Uh, but one of the pieces that's kind of missing is that, you know, there is this production cliff, if you will, you know, when you deliver continuous, continuously. Uh, what happens afterwards? You know, what if something goes wrong? So that's the part that we would address and we'll go deeper in, in as part of the continuous re resilience uh, approach, uh, as well as a mechanism with which you can be confident in terms of taking the delivery uh, to the next level. So what we are seeing today in the market, and it, you know, today's market is moving much faster than before. Uh, the applications that are being lifted and shifted is a category of applications um, that are moving to the cloud platforms, be it AWS, Azure, or Google. And they are being set up with DevOps as the default operations model. You know, anything to do with uh, day two operations is all going through uh, the DevOps mechanism because it's a predictable, again, a continuous delivery uh, across that infrastructure as well. A second set of uh, applications, the modern applications that are being created are some of the older applications that are getting modernized are being built using containers. And those containers are being run on Kubernetes. And those Kubernetes-based applications are getting delivered again using the uh, proven continuous integrations that's taken for granted. Of course, you are facing some challenges and that's where courtship comes in, great. And then continuous delivery part using uh, you know, either open source tools or a combination of open source and service mechanisms in the back end. So in these two models, uh, the new applications that are being built need to be very clear in terms of what they are getting from an operation perspective. Uh, 
but you know when i dig deeper you know ask tougher questions with customers you know particularly the customers that are running business critical applications that are uh, that cannot be uh, taken down for any reason it could be even a cloud failure and so on it's deceptions are the number one enemy against application service level objectives as a law and this deceptions could come from many different ways and we'll go into uh, every one of the categories where the disruptions occur but if you think about just availability numbers wise it's actually scary you know many of uh, the folks uh, maybe on the call everywhere you know they they may not even think in terms of you know what is this 99.95 perspective what is it you know every, once in a while we may look at the table and i say oh um well, the maximum uh, downtime could be just uh, you know 22 minutes but the thing is you can only be done about 22 minutes per month if you are operating 99.95 i mean that is pretty scary if you will right even a single application could take uh, much longer to you know recover uh, combining all the operations as well as the development and delivery and so on so um, the 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 problem here is is that I call it is clearly disruptions are the number one enemy, right? And then, uh, you know, what are the disruptions? That could be many of them. There are different different types of disruptions, and there may be many that uh, we might not might have not documented all of that. But here, one a single deployment could bring down the entire application. I don't know if you have faced that problem uh, in your environment or not. You know, it could be a very simple. Uh, innocent deployment uh, that might be uh, might have been made by a, a, a nice guy, a great developer, but at the end of Friday he made the deployment, right? So that deployment created a chain reaction across, you know, uh, different parts of the service that that entire application is done. So that is one type of uh, mechanism. Uh, individual cloud infrastructure failures. So if you think about cloud infrastructure as a whole, um, the infrastructure as a service provided by AWS, you know, they have been in increasing their resiliency pretty much uh, from the beginning of 2008 onwards, right? There's a huge difference between what used to happen before and now. Individual services are great. So if you took, uh, you know, um, EC2 infrastructure service, or GKE service, those operate at a pretty high resilience level. Of course, you have to read the fine print. But when you combine all these services together, you are actually creating a distributed application or a larger application. Then what happens to your application if those one of those services comes down? Because the service levels for those different services are different. Again, different from service provider to service provider. That is the second type of failure. Third, I don't have to even you know educate anymore. Ransomware attacks are happening every week. You know, a couple of weeks ago there was an aluminum provider out of Europe that was affected um, in their US operations. And you know, if you subscribe to one of these RSS feeds with respect to ransomware attacks, you would see you know time and again, uh, you know, all these attacks are happening all over the place and they are increasing. And they're unpredictable as well. So applications could come down any point in time, unpredictable, even though you know, uh, it's rare and the, the question would be how to actually get the applications back. Now, you know, how do you really predict and at least be prepared for these disruptions? One way to do this is, the older way is uh, do a DR test. Great, you know, if you have all the infrastructure and everything is set up, uh, in a meaningful way, you could potentially do a DR test. You know, if you have outsourced the DR activity to, let's say, SunGuard or IBM Resiliency Services, it becomes a project because you'll have to now sync up with your disaster recovery team because the IP addresses may not even um, uh, replicate uh, to the uh, recovery site. And then uh, DNS collision, all those problems you'll have to take into account. The newer mechanism is that if you are deploying again and again to you know production environments completely, then you could do chaos engineering. You know, you know basically just uh, uh, you know disrupt the application in a predictable fashion using your own mechanisms and see if the application can actually withstand the disruptions. So even those areas, you'll have to really think about 
I know, um, you know, whether the application is going to come down or not, you know, how do you know? Even trying to do that, it, be, you know, becomes complex. Uh, and, you know, uh, AWS, like larger providers, they have created a pretty big white paper, you know, to be specific, it's about 78 pages long or something like that. It, number of pages uh, keeps on increasing. And they have dedicated five pages long DR checklist if you're running business critical applications on AWS as an example. I'm sure similar uh, white papers uh, exist in other cloud service providers as well. So it's complex in its own area. Again, the disruption is real even if you wanted to do uh, testing. And SOX and SOC compliance, you know, if you're operating a SaaS application and, and it's supposed to operate 24 seven, then you'll have to most likely go for an SOC certificate. And these, these organizations demand a proof that you can actually recover the applications in the event of a failure, right? I'm talking about applications in the sense the entire application stack, not necessarily just a bunch of virtual machines and so on. SOX complaints, I think for those of you who have been with the operation side for a longer time, uh, SOX complaints is another mandate from the government to make sure that you can actually recover your, let's say, business critical or financial applications. And finally, but not the least, clouds do fail. Like three weeks ago, Google, um, US East Coast, um, entered into some kind of a long disruptions because of uh, networking issues and so on. A lot of well-known brands um, got affected. In those situations, you could think, uh, can I switch to another cloud, at least temporarily, so that I can borrow some time to uh, prevent the reputation damage to begin with, and also losing business is a big deal. Uh, at least you could borrow some time. Uh, this, I thought, uh, this particular use case, I thought is a unique one that will come in uh, pretty late in the market, but recently, quite recently, one of the well-known uh, brands asked for this, and I, I, I am running our applications on GKE. Can I go to AKS uh, as a, uh, a failover into another cloud? Because uh, clouds do fail. So. There are so many types of disruptions. You know, if you uh, have any of uh, your experiences, we would love to hear from you in terms of what type of disruptions you went through. Um, and you know, if you have any um, additional points to add, we would love to uh, kind of add that as well. And um, you know, if you have any of those, please add that to text. Max uh, will be able to coordinate. And uh, Max, any any other thoughts in terms of uh, asking the audience to um, include their suggestions and uh, thoughts. Uh, no, you can. If you'd like to add something to the conversation, please feel free to put it right into that question panel, and we can uh, take a look later on. Thanks. Great. So the bigger question here is that how to decrease this enemy number one disruptions by fifty to three hundred percentage. You know that's a bold statement here, fifty to three hundred, but that is not. Uh, inaccurate, if you will. So, if you reduce the disruptions uh, from, the, you know, from 99.9, uh, 99% percentage to 99.9% percentage, then you are looking at a huge difference, a 300% percentage. From second layer to third one could be your platinum application or a gold application in terms of RPO and RTO wise. You are looking at a 15% percentage. And the the problem is not just, you know. Uh, a situation that arises once in a while. And so again, the deceptions happen for multiple reasons, including a single deployment. And we are not alone. Uh, Gartner has been noticing an increased um, set of inquiries coming in for cloud resilience since 2016 at 20% plus rate. So uh, they are educating uh, the enterprises uh, they are educating the uh, uh, organizations that are moving to the cloud. And a lot of them, even the SaaS co completely created, you know, cloud-bound, cloud-native application um, developers and SREs, uh, they have not really thought through the entire uh, aspect of the disruptions, that, where could the disruption could come from, and how can they really decrease those disruptions so that their SLOs are intact. So that is the part um, you know, we are going to help in terms of identifying those areas and obviously you have to 
get an idea of how you could quickly reduce the disruptions even if it uh, if they occur uh, how could you really recover from those this is where our integration with courtship comes into kind of really really handy and courtship has been doing very well hey joe if you have a few more points to add into courtship that would love to have them yeah, absolutely. Um, so just want to give a quick plug for CodeShip. Uh, CodeShip is a SaaS-based CI CD tool. Um, so we handle all the backend infrastructure for you so that you can just be focused on uh, running your continuous integration suites uh, and doing continuous delivery. Uh, we have two products, Basic and Pro. Basic aims to be a simple and turnkey solution. Um, it's great for small and simple, straightforward uh, projects. Uh, and then we also have Pro, which is built around Docker and gives a lot more power and customization um, for your overall CI CD pipelines. Um, the demo that we'll do a little bit later will have the Pro interface in there a little bit. Um, and CodeShip accounts are free to get started. Each account provides 100 free builds a month, so it's a great way to try the products out. Um, you can try out, uh, you know, even just side projects or hobby projects are, are a great way to just test things out and get started. Um, and we can also post a link into the chat uh, if you're interested in signing up. Great. All right, so, um, you know, courtship, is, you know, it's very easy to get started and you don't have to really think about managing and maintaining your own CI service. You know, depending on the number of bills that you throw, you will have to manage that infrastructure. Courtship actually takes care of all of that. It automatically scales in the backend, so you could, simply focus on your application and your set of services. Now, disruptions can happen anywhere, like I mentioned. What if we gave you a simple and powerful undo command for your SREs and DevOps, or to you, maybe you are the SRE and DevOps uh, folks in the line. And with a single line of uh, DevOps pipeline code, right, you could, potentially reduce the disruption by 50 to 300 percentage, right? So the way to do it is that you have your CI set up continuously building and releasing using CD capabilities of Codeship as an example. And we could simply take to the next level called continuous resilience, CR, where we would make the copies of your production environment with that single line of code. And then using that, you could do rollback, or recovery, or failover in the same cloud or an alternative cloud. Just think about that situation, right? With this single line of code, you say AX stands for Apranix, uh, protect uh, application uh, protection service, APS, protect your assembly. Assembly is a concept that combines a bunch of services together. As I mentioned, your applications are not uh, you know, two tier or three tier, five tier applications anymore. They are spread across multiple multiple services, multiple infrastructure services, and microservices that are built uh, uh, maybe on the containers completely. So those services put together, you could call that an assembly, you can change the assembly configurations and so on, very flexible mechanism. And then you pretty much integrate that into your DevOps pipeline, and we simply take care of the rest. That way, you have the confidence that if any of those disruptions happen, as I mentioned before, you have the confidence to do an undo of that activity. And by the way, you know, we use it all day long it's using our own pipelines. You know, we, we built our service so that we could use it. And many of other customers also do the same. Pragya is a great example. They operate on Google completely. It's an ed tech company for enterprise, um, ed tech company for universities, and thousands and thousands of students sign into those university portals to interact with Pragya system. So the requirements are very, very stringent in terms of uh, being able to run that application completely on Google platform. And they follow all the standard DevOps practices to release the application updates. They have multiple environments. Uh, even you know some of the larger universities get their own um, uh, tenant, if you will, in a separate instance of Pragya. So multiple environments, but mostly uh, a larger SaaS instance serves many universities in the backend. And Apranix helps them in terms of managing that SLO, in terms of providing that capability to go back in time 
so that you know they can be confident in terms of releasing their application updates or taking that next step in terms of doing a DR test or even in the case of failure, you can very easily recover. That gives them so much confidence in terms of rolling out the next update, right? Next one is um, uh, a huge customer of ours, Live Nation. It's a 10 billion revenue entity, so it's a Fortune 100. And uh, you know they pretty much gave us a lot of requirements in terms of um, what is required from their point of view when they operated on AWS. And they have you know hundreds and you know 120 applications to be specific, and they are growing their application base completely on AWS. They have moved to AWS uh, for a longest time, and they have been highlighted uh, at uh, AWS Read in Invent in terms of how they are able to utilize AWS. But the missing piece is clearly the ability to handle the disruptions. And most of the time, the applications run okay uh, because you know they are kind of a combination of this, uh, the, uh, the legacy as well as the modern application part. And um, you know, if something happens, they have that button to click, a single click to go back and recover the entire application environment. So that's the capability, and they've been using it for a long time. So you could say. All right, uh, Apranix guys, you know, fine and dandy. This is not a big deal. You know, I could, I could potentially create it. Right? You know, I, there are smart people out there. It's very smart people. I have met some of them. You know, um, they can code it up. Uh, one of the SRE leads told me that it's amazing that uh, cloud infrastructure is accessible as a uh, JavaScript object. You know, can you imagine that's so much power given to the developers. That's amazing. And that's real. That's that's how the new applications are getting created. And that's welcome as well, because we need to move away from the infrastructure as much as possible. Now, you could also be a lot more flexible, you know, by packaging them in the containers, because you can wrap all the dependencies. And I, I used to be a developer, so I, I, I could feel the pain at the time that, you know, when you include a libc, that version may not work really well in a production environment with another Lipsy 1.5.7, right? Uh, so it, that kind of incompatibility, I think, will go away completely once all the applications move and get packaged in containers. So eventually you are running your application environments with multiple services put together. Now, the idea is that deceptions happen, that's real, right? It's not a question of not happening, it's happening every day, uh, smaller uh, areas and larger areas and entire application could come down as well. If that's the case, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest question is how to really decrease those disruptions. You could start with cloud automation. You could manage the snapshot lifecycle of your data infrastructure. You have to, you know, there's no point in managing the application disruptions without really managing the data component of your application, data infrastructure, it's complex enough. And then you will have to think about infrastructure code versioning because just like your code uh, managed and checked into GitHub and versioned all of that and then created with a pipeline, people create infrastructure as code. That's a, that's a predictable way to do it. And then, you know, sometimes the newer things get introduced that, you know, seem kind of great, but at the end of the day, they actually introduce newer problems and then comes the state management of the infrastructure as code. Then you will have to manage the Kubernetes infrastructure. There are great services that are becoming available, so you don't have to really worry about the Kubernetes master and so on, but the infrastructure to manage your application, which is basically the worker nodes and all other things combined there, it's your problem, your application um, uh, developer's problem or the SRE problem to be specific. With all of that, we ask the question, you know, can you really guarantee the application resilience, right? And, you know, there's so many moving parts, not only that higher level conceptual to-do list of things, but also the dynamism of the cloud infrastructure itself. Forget about in the parts moving around and then they get killed and recreated in a different node, that's all fine and dandy, that's great. But at the end of the day, my applications and your applications need to survive the deceptions, right? And and then even if you created one of those, you know, that there is an automation system nightmare, depending on the type of application, depending on the type of infrastructure that you're working on. Uh, so that's where, uh, is there an easy solution? 
and innovation comes in and that's where courtship actually engaged with this in terms of highlighting this innovation across their uh, customer base and we come in here and say yes there is an easy easier and a robust and, and perhaps a lower cost and i don't want to highlight that one as you know but it is it is much lower than what you would expect in terms of putting together and compared to uh, the the disruptions and the, the bad reputation or the uh, loss of revenue type of situation uh, our solution could actually potentially help a lot and you can very easily get started uh, the solution is available on the aws marketplace google marketplace as well and in part of the red hat container catalog so we made it easier to get started and consume similar to courtship so uh, the process is very simple one two three four so the one two three four steps are very easy to get started you put in your cloud um, uh, access point and we discover all the infrastructure necessary with respect to your application where they are running and you can create roughly describe your assembly structures click 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 and put a policy around it then we take care of the rest meaning that an automated application environment time machine is created for you right and that is based on your timeline or could trigger the time uh, time machine copies based on your check-ins as well so you could basically just make a copy just before um, you know deploying that large perhaps uh, uh, disruptive deployment right so you want to be confident about it and you don't want to just do a backup of it because the backup will only help you with respect to a tradition backup that can continue to happen that's not a problem but how do you really kind of you know if something were to happen i have to borrow some time and yeah, sorry it cannot just expect to magically you know uh, press bunch of page duty uh, or slack buttons and then get the job done it's really really hard when it breaks then if you pro if you provided a single click uh, rollback capability that's one of the you know, great functionality that we have or a failover you know you don't want to actually disturb the existing in a production environment as is in one of the regions i want to just borrow some time I, you know i can lose one or two um you know buckets or something like that but you know i should be able to kind of get some of the um you know data that that customers are losing right now if that's the case you could actually recover in another region as well so the rtos need to be really really uh, compelling in this case so in essence you could pretty much integrate with any of your uh, devops tool set you know integrate with you know jenkins cicd or any other cicd pipelines one liner and you have your production environment it automatically builds the application environment time machine and then you have all the flexibility to get your application resiliency the way you wanted it are uh, you know much better than uh, what it used to be and uh, and with that you know we can actually provide three levels of resiliency and of course there are some caveats here uh, within the same cloud provider you can move between you know within the region uh, not a problem within two between two zones if you have not set up you know kind of an auto scaling uh, between two zones you know maybe this is a great way to get started to give you a zonal level within the region um, um, uh, you can protect and then between the region obviously you know we can retain all the uh, metadata all of that and recreate all the infrastructure completely from scratch except the cases where the data copies need to be made and we manage that as well and uh, you achieve level 2 resiliency in the cases where you want to switch to another cloud provider completely and this is applicable only for the stateless containers for now so we manage the kubernetes uh, capabilities in the back end to give you the capability to switch to another cloud provider uh, of you know kubernetes or uh, service on the uh, on the side and then you can actually connect back to your data infrastructure uh, a copy of the data infrastructure if you will uh, to make sure that your applications actually come up so we have that flexibility in the same platform it's very easy to consume and actually uh, with the click of a button so you can get started today in both the marketplaces and uh, this is what we are apranix is a proven easy to get started solution and we provide continuous application resiliency that can be integrated into your pipelines we are a secure nine, uh, saas provider with a 99.9 percentage sla and we need to be confident about that we will end up paying penalties to our customers uh, so we operate at, at 99.95 sometimes we push it to 99.99 even though we operate on uh, uh, some of the well-known cloud provider uh, out there 
and we are we have been recognized by enterprise management associates one of the top three management platforms so let me stop there if there are questions please uh, do not hesitate to kind of type it in and what i'm going to do is that right at the half an hour time i'm going to dive into a demo uh, with a real code uh, with a real recovery all of that good stuff you know powerpoint is great uh, it's great for me but you know so for some people it's powerpoint to death but you know i, I hope I gave you a conceptual understanding of continuous application resilience, you know, CI, CD, and now CR. Uh, questions, you know, Max, um, hopefully, you know, you're able to manage that uh, situation if uh, questions are coming in. Uh, if there are questions, you know, you can interrupt me so that I can answer. Uh, otherwise, uh, I assume that we can go ahead and do the demo. Uh, we have a few, but I think that we can cover them after the demo for sure. Sounds very good, Max. Thank you. All right. So what we are going to do is to change the code, disrupt, kind of uh, simulate the disruption, if you will, and then let's see if we can recover it. I'm going to switch over to, let's say, seven different tabs. This is scary uh, to even start with, but I will start with the code. So here is the code, and uh, CodeShip actually builds that code with a click of a button. I don't have to even click that button. It automatically takes care of you. We built, we built the pipeline. The application is actually a very nice application, meaning that you can actually go and buy broken pieces of socks. Um, you know, I, I cannot, I, I cannot seriously imagine paying ninety-nine dollars for this one. But um, you know, this this particular shop is actually real, by the way. It is a sock shop in the UK, and they were kind enough to open source their distributed application to the open source community, and everyone uses it. We customize it. Um, you know, thanks to VBox, they actually uh, put that kind of a nice uh, um, buttoned-up version of that, and then we we modified that as well to our to our demos. So it's a very distributed application. You can go ahead and um, buy any type of socks. Uh, of course, uh, I cannot ship them to you. Uh, I don't have that facility. You know, I don't have a Prime or anything, uh, but they are nice to kind of uh, look at. And then you know, uh, the the site is real, and you know, it, it, the old days of website is, oh, a bunch of catalogs, they're running, but that is not the case with this application. This is a very distributed, dynamic application running on GKE, right? So this application, as you can see, the component-wise is too many that, to talk about, about you know, 50 different container nodes. What we'll do is that we'll just um, uh, kind of, focus on one particular namespace in this particular case sock shop i have to actually switch and then switch back just to give you an idea so this set of parts of course uh, there will be multiple services at the back end you can see these all front-end services that are being managed gk level and then there are external services so we are going to combine set of services running on the containers on kubernetes particularly gke and then there is an external service for catalog db that's an external service running and that external service actually runs on uh, uh, Cloud SQL. So that is uh, is a managed um, MySQL database instance uh, running on a Google platform. So here it is. It's a single instance that's uh, running there. And in the back end, you can see the databases and the database is one of the databases and multiple databases. One of the databases is SOC, SOCSDB. That is the database that we are using in the back end for this application. And uh, GKE, and you know, if you go to the Kubernetes engine, a uh, bunch of uh, clusters we have, but one of the clusters is uh, uh, the GKE cluster uh, Eastern uh, cluster. And uh, for the demo purposes, I'm going to switch the application over to the West Coast, to the uh, Central uh, US. So let's look at the cluster here that runs all the services um, for the stocks. Uh, shop application. You can see a bunch of these services are running the backend and a bunch of our components as well running as well. So all these are fine and dandy. That's great. So what we are going to do uh, is to kind of knowingly disrupt this application. And in the backend, uh, you know, uh, you can get started with a Pranix uh, here. So you log in. Uh, I separated the container part and the Cloud SQL part as a separate assembly, so you can go back and forth. So in two different tabs. So that is the container part, and this is the um, the, the uh, Cloud SQL uh, part. So to start with, you log in, get credentials, 
um, you know, you can pretty much uh, configure your cluster. It's very easy to do. Uh, give the name, uh, cluster selection. It automatically, you know, we give you a curl command, cut and paste in your shell. It takes care of everything. You get your clusters, uh, you know, configured in no time. So we automatically just, um, you know, get all the metadata. Uh, Sockshop is one of the namespaces that uh, we get. And then a print assembly, uh, you could actually uh, uh, put a policy you can you can protect again uh, so so to speak that the backup is already built in right you don't have to worry about that because you know unless we kind of backed up you now how can we recover how can we give you that um, you know recovery capabilities or failover capability so you can have uh, different types of policies I will walk over that one as well so you apply the policy and, and you apply the protection plan and then protection plan takes care of based on your policy right and it builds the timeline automatic. So this is the time machine that I'm talking about. When you say time machine, don't imagine that it's too complicated or anything. It's a very simple, easy to use approach in terms of going back in time. So you can just go back in time, click uh, a button to recover. So I will demonstrate that at that point, um, you know, after disturbing the application. And and Cloud SQL is a very similar one. You know, you configure your cloud configurations and you can configure AWS, Google, uh, um, you know, we can get one of the in any regions for that matter and we already configured and configured the cloud SQL So it's discovered completely and you have an assembly um, That's called sock shop um, Managed dev that is the uh, one that is running in the cloud SQL um, on uh, Google in this particular region council bluffs, so uh, That is completely automatically discovered. I uh, don't have to worry about in terms of Google changing from Gen 2 to Gen 3, you know, they are move, moving to Gen 3 pretty soon. All of that is taken care of, so cloud assemblies are ready to go. Now, uh, from uh, application perspective, the application is protected uh, with a protection plan here, and that protection plan has an external service. That external service is this sock shop testing uh, service that provides the data infrastructure. So you can combine the entire stack. That's it, that's all you do. And what we are going to do is to change this application for now. So uh, as you had seen, this sock shop is great. It's working and I can go and buy the socks, but wait a minute, literally. Uh, so I'm going to just introduce a knowingly simple, uh, simple change. So a simple change. Let's commit it. GitHub is great, I love it. Um, so guess what, you know, you go here and I didn't do anything because the pipeline is already set up, it's already running. So the simple change is being run in terms of running the unit test, all of that necessary. Um, and of course, it takes care of all of this. Very simple UI um, in the backend, everything is integrated. So unit tests are run, uh, the images uh, from the latest container will be automatically uh, checked into, pushed into GCR, Google Container Registry, that is GCR. And, and then we will automatically initiate the resilience. So if you think about what I'm referring to is basically this component where this process is happening, CI and the CD is happening. And then third step is the CR that's happening right here. Uh, initializing uh, a Pranix application resilience will start in a second. And once uh, that process is started, I will show you exactly uh, how that process is uh, initiated right here in the activity log, uh, that protection automatically starts. So an on-demand backup of your container environment is initiated, right? Not only that, you are, uh, that is fast. Great, thank you, because it's not a big change. So incremental, everything is, completely incremental. So don't worry about kind of capturing huge amount of data, nothing like that. It's all incremental metadata and also incremental copies of your databases for your applications where it demands. So if you're not changing much, only zero KVs will be kind of recorded in the database as well. Whereas in this particular case, uh, the Cloud SQL uh, database will be automatically initiated with a backup. But if you go to, so this working here, um, uh, the infrastructure uh, backups are happening automatically. Um, so the on-demand backups are automatically created for you, right? You don't have to do anything except just plugging in few initial credentials 
uh, the backup is happening. So backup is done um, and it will get back in terms of, uh, uh, we have some more things to kind of finish up uh, in terms of uh, putting the final um, uh, details around the uh, uh, version management between Cloud SQL and your application stack. So we automatically take care of that one. That way, with that particular check-in here, um, all the deployment is complete, which means that we captured your environment copy just before the application is deployed. You know what? The reason for that is now, uh, go back to the initial page of the application, the application unfortunately is dead, useless. And I wanted to buy that application and now I, I, I love the socks, you know, one or two socks that I thought I could, I could take it, but unfortunately, you know, I cannot even see the images. I mean, you know, I'm at this, at this time, I'm losing business. I'm, I'm losing my reputation as well. I think about on a prime day, maybe Amazon is a wrong example. I mean, you could take any example uh, because they can run in multiple regions and they can bring it up. Uh, the, 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 even the performance slowdown is a problem nowadays, right? So now what we do? It's a problem that we can actually address. So what we are going to do is to go back in time, in the timeline, and before that, you know, we took a copy. So what we are going to do is to just recover that particular copy from that particular time. So we are going to select not only that, we are going to actually use a central US cluster, okay? Because I, I don't know what's happening. I, I don't want to disturb my production instance. I'm going to just deploy it. And I'm going to include a copy of the Cloud SQL with the real world data, with everything from that external service. I'm going to just click a button. That's all there is to. So I'm going to just, uh, oh, already start. I shouldn't have refreshed. Uh, so that part already started here. So uh, once that part is initialized, uh, the, you can see the backend, um, you know, Cloud SQL instance will also be uh, recovered and um, that uh, recovery will also start immediately right after um, the, the backup is, is done. So here, uh, this is the part that uh, sometimes I get into when I kind of mix both the uh, data here. Um, so the recovery logs will also get started here. So you can see all of that is automatically kind of uh, taken care of for you. And in the back end, the recovery will automatically start. And here, a copy of your Cloud SQL instance has been created here, right? And that copy comes from a production environment and that uh, automatically, there are no backups by the way, there is nothing here, this is a new instance. Right, and that new instance is being created automatically and the exact size of that instance, all of that is same, including the data, just before the application went down. Right, that the pipeline gives you the detail in terms of what it is. This is the point where we took the copy and then here is the GK environment that actually deployed uh, with a new code and we get the copy right here uh, in terms of uh, taking care of the sizes of the Cloud SQL, the complexity of the Cloud SQL. Uh, you don't have to know any detail with respect to you know, how it is handled, how the APIs are, you know, what are the de details between Gen 2 versus Gen 1 uh, Cloud SQL, and you know, how many vCPUs, what is my memory that I used to run at that particular point in time? Oh, you know, is the storage sufficient for this? You know, what is the command? And by the way, you know, can I call uh, data certified uh, Google administrator? There are two different, you know, professional certifications available, one for compute, another for data infrastructure. So now we have to combine these two guys together if they are certified to figure out where the situation is. And then you will have to really think about the connections between your recovered instance as well as your application. Now. Not only that, you will have to really think about uh, your containers running in a different region. So Kubernetes engine clusters are running in three different um, clusters were running. So we actually used this particular one in this particular case. Now you can see all those containers, services and all of that have been deployed here and they've been automatically 
um, you know, if, if you wait a little longer, these parts will automatically spin up, um, increase in terms of size and so on, so that they are back to where uh, they used to be in their primary cluster, which we didn't disturb because what if this situation is very simple to address and then we only work too hard to kind of recreate that infrastructure, maybe we wasted infrastructure as well. So in that case, you know, keep that aside, you can recover your application at a, that particular fail point in time. You can retain your reputation. Your SLOs are intact, more or less. And yeah, as long as you are, uh, you haven't signed too much bad SLA, you know, you could be well within your SLA. Uh, you don't may, may not have to pay the penalty and so on. So all of that is great. And, and we were able to achieve all of that with a single click. And that single click, uh, it takes care of the deployment uh, you know, some of the things that we can control, some things we cannot, meaning that we orchestrate all of the necessary steps, make sure that everything is intact, and we'll wait for the steps to complete as well. But sometimes, uh, you know, the service providers run their own services at a different um, pace. So some are really, really quick, some are slower, and sometimes, uh, depending on the, the workload, they might slow down the recovery uh, and so on. And also, you know, we haven't thrown in a larger instance. Typically, for the demo purposes, we don't throw in a large instance. It's a very small one VCP instance, and it is actually you know high CPU utilization. So that is also taking a little bit of time. We should have thrown in a better instance uh, to recover quickly. So as you can see, uh, all these situations, you know, you will have to manually go through all these processes to understand what's happening, uh, what's happening in terms of your application. If you are really bringing in multiple parties to the application here uh, and those those components are too many so you know every one of these components might have um, let's choose a better one uh, component might have a different um, application uh, developer right and and you'll have to identify that particular developer the page duty type of services will actually help and you know if you are able to really gather all the information through the logs maybe you are able to identify those logs as well but in most of the situations it's really really difficult to identify by looking at this particular nice icon how the hell do i know which developer from an sre perspective right uh, how do i know um, i can bring up that particular person and you know uh, connect all the dots together to resolve this particular uh, situation in time so that i can recover my application really quickly. So recovery in progress, uh, it takes about uh, 10 minutes. So uh, I'm trying to explain all other aspects of it. Um, I should have warned you uh, at the beginning. It takes about eight to 10 minutes, depending on the time, to recover the data infrastructure of this application. The front end stateless component of the application is really, really fast. As you can see, the GK part uh, even failed over really, really quick because we are able to manage both the uh, containers aspect as well as uh, the, uh, the the configuration of all the uh, clusters in the back end, those are all quick. So the newer infrastructures like Kubernetes are in a way easier to handle, but the older infrastructure that are running on VMs, they are a little more, you know, you, know, you have to have a little more patience with them. And some services are quick, some services are bad. And you know, those of you who have really worked on the database side would understand the complexity associated with kind of recovering the entire databases with a click of a button, right? And that's what uh, is being done here and without knowing any of the, the time frame. So if you think about it, um, the, the timeline, you know, we could go back in time, uh, any time here for that matter, on-demand copies can be recovered. So this is the time machine that I'm talking about. You can pretty much get into any of these timelines and you can actually recover at that particular point in time. Um, Maybe, uh, Max, we could answer some other question because I'm also looking at the clock and while answering, uh, perhaps the, the, the data recovery is done and the applications uh, will be back. Sure, so we have a few questions that are all somewhat similar. I'm gonna kind of combine them into one. Okay. Um, you mentioned AWS, uh, Google Kubernetes Engine. What about a tool like DigitalOcean or any other tools? What, what, what would you integrate with or not integrate with? How can people find out? Uh, sure, so uh, today, uh, DigitalOcean as a plain infrastructure as provider, meaning compute uh, is not supported. But if you're signing up for DigitalOcean Kubernetes service, 
uh, we can uh, protect that uh, set of uh, you know applications running on the Kubernetes service. So as long as it is Kubernetes, we support that. The data infrastructure within DigitalOcean is not supported because you know we have to really focus on uh, some of the providers that are out there. So if you are Kubernetes running uh, running on DigitalOcean, we can actually help you kind of recover them on GKE or AKS or EKS on the AWS side. All right, great. Um, when starting with with Appernix, uh, would you recommend that someone just goes right to your website and get started? Do you recommend they already have specific tools? And I, I know we kind of just covered this, but do you recommend they already have specific tools in place? Um, where where do you feel the starting point is? Uh, the starting point is actually it's better to get started if you're a Google or an AWS uh, customer. It's very easy to get started from here. So uh, if you go to uh, AWS Marketplace or a Google Marketplace, um, you know it's it's right there um, and it's well integrated. Uh, you can pretty much click and go, and uh, you know it's it's a subscribe button right here. That's it. Once you subscribe, you are in. You create your account. Um, by the way, you get some credit as well uh, for 14 days, so you can experiment with uh, our uh, platform. Uh, for those of you uh, who do not operate on cloud platforms, uh, but you know, uh, you can pretty much sign up uh, through us. You know, just send an email, we'll create an account for you, or uh, we are going to open up uh, to public uh, pretty soon uh, because you know we wanted to basically go through the billing aspect uh, wanted to be taken care of, so we go through cloud providers at the moment. But you can very easily get started with an email. All right, great. Uh, before I continue, just to let everyone know, I did fail to mention this earlier, a very short survey will pop up at the end of this, just asking basically what you'd like to learn more about in the future. So at the very end, if you wouldn't mind being able to just take that in for a minute, that'd be great. All right, so let's um, let's move on. Excellent. So let's see if uh, the recovery is done. The recovery is, is complete. That's great. So we are going to uh, look at uh, CPS and see the recovery is complete with a new instance. What we are going to do is to, I'm going to use a simple kind of a switch of the DNS because we need to switch the DNS a little bit because sometimes switching the DNS is, uh, um, is an issue because now you have to really get the permission. So in our AWS product, we actually get the permission ask you to type uh, to kind of uh, switch over. In this particular case, you know, we give you maybe a script, you know, you can add that in your, um, we'll simplify it, but you can very easily customize it to your requirement and uh, uh, it's going to simply switch over the DNS of um, uh, the Cloud SQL here. Once that is done, uh, the DNS cache needs to be kind of, you know, it's about 30 seconds to get rid of the cache and, and the application will be up and running. So let's see if uh, the application is already kind of getting there or not, um, should be ready to go in a second. So, so you can see the entire process is, uh, is very, very kind of smooth in terms of achieving that continuous resilience without doing much, uh, except initially setting up some of the, uh, the pipeline as well as setting up the discovery of uh, the, uh, your initial assemblies. That's about it. And those are all again automated uh, because we don't know all your environments, so we cannot pretty much kind of uh, put an assembly automatically, but that would be the, uh, the easiest thing to kind of assemble. And once assembly is done, the application uh, will show up uh, just like this, and uh, you know, you'll get the time machine. So uh, it should be done in a second. All right, that's done. So what we are going to do is to refresh this application. Great. So now, so while talking about, let's say 12, uh, actually 15, so, te uh, so 12 minutes, I was able to recover your application, right? The entire application stack uh, running on GKE with a new copy of the application uh, of the infrastructure. I didn't disturb uh, the production instance of your database. This is a new instance and uh, the production environment is not disturbed. So this is a new cluster running in a different region, all of that, uh, instead of uh, the East Coast, 
uh, you know, we are running on the uh, the central uh, US, right? And this may be running, the cluster may be running your application may not be, right? That was a situation before. So that's about it. And, um, you know, if there are any more questions, uh, please let us know. Uh, both on the code chip side as well as the pranics, we are available to answer any of the questions that you might have. So thank you very much. Uh, finally, are there any more questions? If there are questions, then we would love to answer. Otherwise, uh, we actually conclude this uh, presentation. I'd like to let's go over one more that's come up, and this can be for yourself or for Joe, whoever whoever wants to take this. Um, but you were talking about how Appernext works with any CI CD solution. So what do we feel really sets CoShip apart for this partnership? Uh, probably I can jump in. I think Joe may be on mute or something. So, you know, what we see is that, you know, industry is here. Uh, clearly, you know, since CloudB started, you know, Jenkins pretty much revolutionized the CI part and a lot of other companies started as well. Then the CD came along, now a lot more plays with respect to CD because it's all driven by uh, the need for deploying applications in a smaller chunks and faster and faster as well. So there's enough complexity in terms of CD. Uh, but that is just the beginning of the problem because now the, the issue is a lot of CD uh, activities happening into staging our test dev environments because you, know, you can check in so many times a day, but nothing is kind of, it's very difficult to convince your SIU to go and deploy your wonderful code, uh, knowing that it could actually bring down the application. Because what is the guarantee? There is no guarantee. So that is where CR actually is really, really helpful because no problem guys, go ahead, do it. Uh, yeah, at least you, know, you can actually start doing this activity in the staging environment, you can actually instead of production, you can do a CR at this level so that you, know, you can make copies and recover and then check it out. Uh, before rolling into, into production and that too you can roll out into smaller chunks of your application so the combination from our point of view is really really powerful i think we are the first one in the industry the combination of core ship and apranix push the boundary to to kind of uh, kind of brought the the entire devops tree of closure if you will uh, there may be you know devsecops and other things but that, that are happening anyway but we kind of close that loop so that we enabled uh, the application deployments to be uh, sooner. Joe, anything more to add? I think that's a great summary. Um, and you know, maybe just to add on that a little bit, I, I think one of the things that uh, a hosted service, uh, a SaaS-based CI/CD service like CodeShip brings is that um, it 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 sort of simplifies that DevOps tool chain a little bit. So at least like your your CI/CD stuff isn't also wrapped into um, you know other systems that um, you know like like we've been discussing here today, like there's all kinds of disruptions and failures that can happen, um, you know. So maybe having you know a little bit of that workload distributed to another service um, is helpful for your particular um, configuration and use case. And by the way, Apranix doesn't move any of the infrastructure from you know. It's all managed on the cloud, your own account, everything. We simply come in as as a CR provider and manage everything. So we don't take any of your data out none of that everything is managed within your own accounts by using uh, your own services that you buy from google and amazon and so on so everything stays within your account we simply come in and make sure that you achieve the continuous resilience all right uh we are at the top of the hour there's a few more questions i'm going to make sure they get answered offline we do have some uh, some more good ones too in the meantime i don't want to take up anyone anyone's time you did commit just one hour after all uh before we go govin joe anything you would like to say so thank you very much really appreciate uh your patience in terms of listening to us this is a new concept um we would we might have pushed a lot of uh, data the information uh to you, your brains but the process is very simple ci cd and cr so we are pretty much helping that the final frontier of the DevOps pipelines. Nea Sari should be happy. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, Govin, for participating in this, uh, talking about Apernix. That survey is about to pop up for everyone, and we look forward to talking to you all again real soon. Wonderful. Thank you, guys.